day after, the latest. Today we have a guest lecture, Violeta Rivarska Chodraska. She holds an MBA from the University of St. Cyril's and Methodius from Skopje. She has more than 15 years of research experience. So now that the floor is yours, please start with the presentation. And if you have any questions, feel, feel free to ask. I hope everybody can hear me. You don't have technical problems. Please try if it's okay. Uh, thank you. As you've just said, uh, I have more than 15 years of experience, of which at least 10 I'm working together with, with him. We are cooperating. I'm working in uh, one VIP uh, with a telecom uh, operator, part of uh, Telecom Austria group. And uh, we had the pleasure to work with GFK and Yupcho for more than a decade, so I'm really pleased to be here. Today we will speak about, especially about uh, quantitative research, but um, at first I would like to say something more about uh, the way we are uh, deciding which kind of methodology we would use for uh, answering a certain question or researching a certain uh, problem. Um, the first thing I would like to address is the difference between market research and uh, marketing research. When we speak about market research, the first feedback that we always get is, wow, this is really confusing, this is too much information, do we really need this, what does it mean, how we will use this, what is the main difference between market research and marketing research, why do we need this in marketing? So the, the main thing, the, the core difference between market research and marketing research is the scope of the whole concept. When we talk about market research, uh, we are talking about researching a narrow group of consumers. Uh, when we want to uh, get uh, significant uh, data about some niche market maybe, or some segment of users, or uh, to find uh, enough information for us to conclude about different segments uh, on the market. When we talk about marketing research, we are talking about the marketing process. So basically, marketing research includes market research. And in the next slides, I will try to explain what you really need to do in order for you to have uh, significant data for your marketing strategy and to have a, an answers to a different kind of questions or to establish uh, some kind of trends or patterns or to pre-test or to post-test or to uh, make a pricing research or whatever you would need in order for you to get the job done. Um, what is the main thing to do? And this is, um, this is our experience. We tried a number of different ways in order for us to have enough uh, data and enough information about, um, about the market. Uh, the best thing to do is to write a research brief. And I will try to explain now what does a market research brief means. Uh, the first thing that the research brief is addressing is the problem definition. The, the problem definition 
is an indication of specific marketing decision area that will be clarified by answering of some of the research questions. And this is the first step in the writing of research brief. The second step is situation analysis. That means an informal gathering of uh, background information uh, in order for the researchers, for us, to realize um, what, um, what is the main area of the interest or the decision area. The second step, the third step, is isolate, identify the problems, but not the symptoms. If we have a situation when we have a drastic drop of the satisfaction of the customers with some kind of service, the main thing is not the drop, but the reasons that they are stating as a reason for um, giving a significantly lower score of, uh, of the satisfaction. So sy symptoms can be confusing. And that's why we are not addressing the symptoms, but we are asking and identifying problems. Uh, what is um, the most important thing to do is to state the research objectives. Because if you don't know where you are going, the road will lead you anywhere. Uh, understanding uh, how um, the budgeting influences the process of proposal of research and uh, the research design. So like any kind of brief, the first thing to do after writing this is to have a debrief. And the brief is the very, very uh, significant step in preparation for any research project, no matter if it's uh, qualitative or quantitative. The methodology is just the, uh, determining the methodology is just one of the uh, steps that you should make in order to get the objective analysis and answers to your questions. So now we will go through uh, each of the steps of um, of creating a research brief and uh, of creating an, and selecting appropriate research design. So as I already said, the first step is problem definition. The first questions that, the question that you should answer is, what is the purpose of the study? What will we, get, will we gain when the results are done? Uh, how much we already know about this problem? Do we need to have additional background information in order for us to give a good brief to the researchers, to the research agency, so they could create a good questionnaire because everything is starting with the brief and the following step is creating of the questionnaire or the sample, creating of a sample or uh, deciding which kind of methodology we will use or what kind of sample design will, and so on. So the next, way, uh, the, next, the next question is what is to be measured? What is important for us? How to measure this? Uh, and and at the end of the day, this is the point of um, of the development of the of the research project when we are asking ourselves, should research be conducted? The first thing that we uh, we should have in mind is that we are not conducting. Uh, primary research for every unanswered question or um, whenever we are not certain about the outcome of the situation. Um, apart from the primary uh, research results, there are always a secondary research results, um, especially when uh, you are working in environment when uh, where uh, the research researches are conducted regularly as trackings 
and um, you can see a pattern or trend or a scheme uh, that will show you uh, the way um, the market is growing or downsizing or to give you specific answers about some questions that when the research was conducted we were not even sure that some at some point we would need them. So the secondary research results are very important and they don't cost anything. The, the main issue is that they should be uh, with a proper methodology because if you need to see some, uh, some general part, part, patterns of the market uh, and you have conducted uh, focus group discussions, they can sh share some light on the issue that you are trying to research, but uh, the point where, where you need some general market indications, uh, unfortunately, they will not help you. But if you are tracking the whole market and, and at one point you want to know, for example, let's say, uh, what media channel, channels your specific target group is uh, using in order to get an information that, and that is the regular question in some other survey, you would have an opportunity to get uh, extra information without uh, any cost, with just with just little bit of uh, cross tabulations or just a different kind of. Uh, analysis. Um, basic research design. This is something that is uh, very um, important to understand before any kind of uh, research is asked for. The first question is, should we use quantitative or qualitative research? If we want to have a general market conclusion when we can where we can say that I don't know 60% of population is watching TV regularly then qualitative research will not give us uh, enough information for us to uh, to get this kind of information if we want to have quantifiable information then Qualitative research is just not something that could help us. Exploratory versus conclusive. If we have qualitative research, then we will get exploratory results. If we have quantitative research, then we'll have a conclusive results. And this is something that must be understood when we are asking different kind of methodologies to get a specific answers. Uh, the main difference between the qualitative and quantitative research is uh, having a small sample versus large samples. If we have focus group discussions, they have small sample with six to eight people in group. If we have one group with six to eight people and according to, to research standards we have just another one like that to have um, to have um, um, oh, to um, yes uh, just to make sure that the first group is giving the same uh, the same uh, answers we have another one in order for uh, for us to have a secondary um, Confirmation. <laughs> Confirmation. That was the word that I was missing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but when we have large samples, we are going with uh, quotas for us to have um, uh, 
conclusions about specific group on the market or to have a national representative sample, which is uh, at least 1,000 uh, people. But if we have a quota, then we need at least 100 people in the base in order for us to have a significant statistical base so we can have a conclusive, uh, conclusive uh, data. Um, also, when we, when we have a qualitative research, we have a broad range of uh, questions. We are using guides uh, versus uh, structured uh, questions when we have quantitative research. Also, when we have qualitative research, we have subjective in interpretations of, of, the, um, uh, of the discussions uh, versus statistical analysis when we have quantitative research. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> I was understood here. So when we have um, a selection of sample, um, the main thing that we should address is who or what is the source of the data. Um, do we need a target populations to be a, a population to be identified? How accurate the sample? Uh, must be, and this is a very, very important step in the writing of the brief. We must know um, uh, how accurate this, uh, this sample is, because if we don't have enough people in the sample, then the conclusion conclusions might be misleading. Uh, do we need a national representative sample, 1,000, as I already said? Uh, or do we need a bigger sample if we need some kind of regional analysis? Uh, th uh, those are the questions that should be addressed in the brief so the researchers know what is the problem, how big is the problem, what to, uh, what to include uh, in the proposal for, uh, for the methodology. Uh, data gathering is also a step that should be right in the in the brief. Who will gather the data? How long uh, the gathering of the data will uh, take? What kind of operational procedures need to be uh, followed? When it comes to the data analysis, we should make sure to know um, how the data will be categorized what kind of statistical software will be used. Uh, the major uh, market research uh, agencies use, uh, use a software developed by them. So this is the, the major strength uh, of, the, of the agencies. They, used, they use a license software in order to get uh, a good analysis of the, of the data gathered from the field. Uh, so, also one of the questions that need to be addressed here is um, for the researchers to know how the the, uh, the final report would look like, is how many variables are we to investigate simultaneously. Um, and everything is, is leading to the uh, final report. The main thing to know about writing a final report and expecting the final report is who will read the report. I mean, for me, uh, a database in SPSS or in Excel is good enough in order for me to uh, uh, to know what to do next with the, with the results or how to use them or how to present them to, to my colleagues and uh, how to, uh, to continue with the analysis of the data. But when we have a, um, a report that should be addressed to the higher level of the management, uh, we would need uh, management summary, we would need a, a presentation. That's why we have to, um, to determine the format of the written report. And uh, at the end of the day, we should decide, uh, do we need a review that would be uh, helpful for the people who will receive, receive the final data? So uh, type of report is... Um, and also, this is um, 
uh, this is something that is um, uh, determining the price, the cost for uh, for the for the research. If you don't need management summary, if you don't need PowerPoint presentation, if you just need data, uh, databases, then the cost of the of the research would be uh, lower. Um, and we are coming to the how much the project costs. Um, there, <laughs> uh, usually uh, people are people. Uh, Management is uh, considering the costs for uh, for research in order to uh, to address the business case. Uh, do uh, do we need to spend money in order for us to get enough information so the business case can be uh, backed with uh, with uh, market data? Um, if we are conducting a uh, huge research on national representative sample, then uh, this might cost a lot. But at the end of the day, you don't want to get a product out on the market that you don't know how it would be uh, accepted by that market. Um, also, when uh, post-testing is in question, you really want to know, did you made any kind of difference? Was that accepted? Would this project, uh, would this uh, product uh, be used for a longer time period? Did you get that uh, customer for a longer time period or no? Um, at the end of the day, uh, whatever you spent on market research is not, uh, is not money thrown out in the air. It's something that you need in order for you to have a legitimate and successful business. Uh, the second question when the planning of the market research uh, project is in question is, is there an acceptable time frame? If you, you must know that uh, whatever methodology you choose to use, you would need some, somewhere between uh, four to six weeks uh, for you to to have uh, the data, you you cannot gather data about yesterday, only about the, the future. So you need time to to do that. You you could you couldn't you couldn't rush, and you you can rush this process of gathering the information. Um, usually. Uh, big companies, even uh, smaller ones, are using vendor when uh, when market research is in question because you need a uh, number of people uh, for any kind of project to be uh, conducted. You you need a cutting center, you need mystery shoppers, you need um, moderators for for focus groups, you need data processing, and at the end of the day, you need <laughs> market research data analyst to tell you what those numbers and percentage means. Um, what is very important for you to, to know is that um, market is re research, uh, uh, that market research brief is very important for you to know what you asked and what you gained from the, from the research process. At the one hand, you, you have uh, research uh, um, questions and research objectives and uh, problem that should be researched. And on the other hand, six or four to six weeks after the initial brief, you have uh, market research data. This market research data should address the problems stated in the in the market research brief. So uh, the requester knows what he asked and for from the researcher and for researcher to know did he give um, significant answers to the to the problems uh, stated in the research brief. Like any kind of project, we need to establish a timeline 
uh, of the research starting from the brief at least one week to questionnaire to to sample size to methodology to to design of the research then followed with field work with data analysis with presentations with reviews so every step of the research project has its timeline and if if everything is planned beforehand on like it should be then the timeline of the research project should not exceed eight weeks uh, so on this lectures on this lecture we will uh, we should uh, pay more attention to uh, to the quantitative market research methodology uh, as I already stated previously uh, quantitative market research means customer surveys and questionnaires there are three most common <clears throat> quantitative market research methodologies the first one is CATI computer assisted telephone interview and like any kind of methodology, it has its uh, um, good qualities and some, um, some uh, problems. But the first thing that should be stated is that if you, have, uh, if you use CATI methodology, you are assuring high data quality. This is the fastest research to be conducted. With this research, we have a huge time reduction because we are, we are using uh, telephones. Um, and also, you have a complete control of the process of the gathering of the, the process of uh, fieldwork. Uh, so we are, we are using CATI uh, uh, methodology mostly because it's, uh, uh, it doesn't need uh, a lot of time to be conducted. Uh, also, it's assuring a high data quality because we are need we uh, we need uh, quantitative research in order to get a, a broad uh, picture about uh, the market. And also, when it comes to costs, this is a research that it's uh, it's not that uh, expensive. Uh, when it comes to CAVI, Computer Assisted Web Interviewing, uh, I think that I should state that maybe it would be, um, it would have a lower cost than CATI if we had, uh, if we had pool of email <laughs> addresses here in Macedonia, but actually we don't have, and maybe uh, in Europe and in America and all over the world, they are using this kind of uh, uh, quantitative methodology to uh, to gather information from the market. Uh, in Macedonia, we are not using it that much on or in the uh, measuring the whole uh, market. Also, one uh, one thing that we should know that uh, in order for us to use this methodology, we need to have high internet penetration. Uh, in Macedonia at this point is somewhat lower than um, 60%, but um, if we need information about total population, this is not a methodology that at this point uh, it could, uh, could be used and also what is asking is a basic computer knowledge and maybe we have uh, let's say pretty high internet penetration when it comes to the basic computer knowledge then we we can't <laughs> say that uh, copy methodology is um, um, also quantitative uh, uh, methodology. It's computer assisted personal interviewing. We should say that this is just uh, the way the face to face research has evolved uh, when, uh, techno when technology uh, comes in mind because this is face to face, but we are not using pen and pencil interviews anymore. 
uh, the, uh, the interviewees have uh, computers and uh, just uh, it's it's more it's more uh, time consu consuming that Kati and Kavi and also it's more expensive because it's face-to-face uh, -face with uh, uh, interviewers going to the home of the people and talking with them but when it comes to the uh, uh, gathering more accurate information then this is the methodology that should be used. So after after all of this I think that everybody will have uh, the questions, what to use, what kind of methodology to use. Well, from my experience, I think that all of them are pretty legitimate way for gathering uh, of uh, data information from the market. And depending on the market research brief, uh, all of them are legitimate to be used uh, for uh, general information and for um, for more accurate qualification you would like to use some qualitative research um, maybe that is the main reason why no methodology can be considered without any kind of a, of a doubt uh, so uh, what I would like to address at the end of this um, uh, this review is to uh, to tell you that you always need to ask or write for research brief, and this is must. This is a step that should not be taken lightly. And to tell you all, um, happy research. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, students, please apologize for this inconvenience. You know, when technology is involved, sometimes, you know, you cannot do everything right, but we're here and we will repeat it again. So, as Violetta said, there are different types of methods that are used. For example, there are different methods like online survey, telephone survey, face-to-face -face survey, <coughs> and postal survey. Sorry, yeah, the microphone. Uh, online survey can be conducted via email, can be conducted at the home or workplace of the respondent, or can be conducted via mobile device. While on the other hand, the face-to-face -face survey can be conducted again on the street, at the home or workplace, or at other places. So now we will continue with the mixed mode service. As I said, this involves combination of different methods like face-to-face -face and computer-assisted telephone interviews. What is important to stay here is that common questions should be used across all models. Different templates should be used to <coughs> ensure that the look is appropriate. Some more specific text alternatives to support us. Everything should go into one database and there should be easy switching from one mode to another. Apart from this, what I want to talk today is I would like to talk about quantitative observation techniques which actually involve recording the behavioral patterns of uh, people, objects, and events in a systematic manner. And they are divided into three categories, and that is personal observation, electronic observation, and trace analysis. Personal observation actually includes <clears throat> the researcher himself, herself. They are recording the actual behavior as it occurs. They're standing somewhere and they're making notes. On the other hand, the electronic observation <coughs> is the observation that electronic devices actually capture and observe the phenomenon that is occurred, that is being observed. And the trace analysis, I will give a few examples here regarding the trace analysis. When data collection is based on, a phys on the physical traces that the respondent leaves. Uh, such example is garbage research when we go and pick up the garbage of the respondents when, and there we can see some nice information, which brands did he use, what type of shampoo did he use last week or other different information of interest. Apart from this, we have uh, uh, what was used in the past was used that uh, some people were trying to measure the selective erosion of tiles in a museum uh, of the, in front of the exhibition in order to see whether each exhi exhibit was popular or not. Also, the number of different fingerprints on one magazine was used to see whether the respondents look at the advertisement or not. Apart from this, uh, other interesting examples are when a research was made on the position of the radi radio dials in cars to see which radio station is first, which one is second, and to de determine the popularity of radio station. Also, uh, they wanted to evaluate the social status of respondents, and they tried to see what was the size, uh, the, the age, size, and condition of cars on a parking lot. Apart from this, uh, what is nowadays very interesting is the internet analysis. Uh, you know, when we all visit some web page, we leave cookies, and those are used to detect which website did you visit, how long did you stay there, what did you particularly look or not. And this is also important uh, part that is now being developed. Now we will talk about uh, sampling. I will start talking about the sampling. What is important, the three terms are particularly important here, and that is the first one is population, which includes all elements that share a common set of characteristics and they consist actually the universe. What is uh, population? In our case, we want to examine the voting behavior of the total population of Macedonia. Our population will be 18 plus uh, voters registered, at, registered for voting. On the other hand, uh, another interesting term is important here, which is the census, and this involves complete enumeration of all elements, the population of study objects. For example, if we make a census 
This is usually done by State Statistical Office and all population in the Republic of Macedonia, 2 million, for example, is examined. But what we do usually, which saves time and money, is sampling. We take a little bit of sample. This is actually a subgroup of elements. For example, we want to make a coffee and go to our refrigerator and we take one spoon of milk and to see whether the milk is okay or not. Uh, you lost, they lost the signal again. Okay, I will. I'm speaking too fast or we lost the signal. Okay, thank you. So, sampling actually involves taking a certain amount of those elements and based on those elements we make a valid conclusion conclusions for total population. Regarding the classification of sampling techniques, they are usually classified to non-probability and probability sampling techniques. And now I'll explain the difference. In probability sampling techniques, we know actually the probability that each respondent will get, and they are used for statistical, for reaching statistical conclusions. On the other hand, we have the non-probability sampling techniques, and they are divided into four main areas. The first one is convenience sampling, then we have the judgmental sampling, quota sampling, and snowball sampling. In convenience sampling, we choose people because they happen to be at the right place and at the right time. It is convenient for us to, to use this sample. On the other hand, we have the judgmental sampling, when based on the judgment of the researcher, we use the profile of respondents that are needed for a certain research. We have the quota sampling, which actually uses predetermined criteria like uh, gender or age that are being used for uh, for our phenomenon of interest and at the end we have the snowball sampling which actually involves uh, talking to a person who actually fulfills the criteria and then this person uh, directs you to another person who fulfills the criteria and th the third person we have talked to uh, directs you to the fourth person and etc and this is how we build the snowball sample on the other hand the probability sampling techniques include simple random selection which we will talk today and you will see on the next slide we have the systematic sampling when all the respondents that are part of the population are being ordered by certain criteria and then we take each end sample or each 10th, 12th, it depends on, on our number. We have the stratified sample when the population is divided on strata, stratums, which are mutually exclusively categories, and we have the cluster sampling, which are based on geographical areas and other different combination of this probability and non-probability sampling techniques. Now I will continue with the information about sampling. This is how it looks like, actually. On the bay, we have the whole population. We have the whole universe on one side. And from the universe, we draw a specific sample, which for our case, for example, for 2 million, but both for 100 million is 1,000. And based on this sample, we make our research on this sample. And again, we conclude on the total population based on the research on our sample. I will show on the next slide, for example, how a simple random selection looks like. Imagine that we are now 70 people, 17 people that are here attending this uh, webinar. And out of those 17, I will list them in one Excel sheet. And then with a simple command of RAND, I will choose only five of them. And those five will actually represent my sample. I will have no influence over which five go into that sample. And this is actually similar like a lottery, like drawing from a head. They all have the similar probability to enter, but you don't know who will be selected for the research. And that's why this uh, method is very uh, beneficial for using representative studies. Now I will continue with the second part of my presentation, and that is uh, how to ask questions. As you can see here, I have one quotation here, and that is, in reality, asking questions to people 
It's more like uh, fishing an extremely clever fish with the help of a different baits on a different depths without knowing what is going on under the surface. As you can see, it is very hard, but on the other hand, it's uh, more of an art to get the information out of the people. Because at the end of the day, our goal is to get detailed, correct and precise information which will be relevant for uh, the topic of interest that we're researching. We should acquire and keep the interest of the participants and at the end it should be not too long because we should show respect toward personal dignity and integrity of the personality of the respondents because they already invested time in our research and they devoted their attention to us. Choosing the question wording is like uh, telling a journalist story, and that is very important. Here I would say that the issue should be defined in terms of uh, W questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and way. The six Ws. Particularly important are who, what, when, and where. Like you had, imagine that you're telling a story that you want to tell to someone, and just in the reverse way. How would you ask about that story? For example, if I ask uh, which brand of shampoo do you use, you will ask me where do I use it? Do you use it at home, at the gym, or, or any other place? But the question would be different if I ask you which brand of shampoo have you personally used at home during the last month? And I will tell you that in case of more than one brand, please list me all the brands that you know. As I said previously, particularly important are who, what, when, and where, and we will see why, because they actually form the question and you should be as specific as possible. For example, who, if I just ask who, it is not clear when I'm going into a household whether the respondent should answer the question for herself, himself, or for the household. On the other hand, with the question what, it's unclear the respondent how to use how to answer this question if he uses more than one brand of a shampoo. Also, the time frame, the time frame should be very specific, and we will see also on the next slide why this is important. And at the end, the question where? At home, gym, on the road, and etc. I will now continue with the individual question content. Is the question necessary? We always try to measure this, try to evaluate based on the brief, as we have said, and are several questions needed instead of one? And we should focus on the wording itself also. Sometimes several questions are needed. So if I ask you, do you think that Coca-Cola is tasty and refreshing soft drink? You will say, Coca-Cola is not tasty, but it's very refreshing, right? And as you can see here, we have what is called double barrel question. We have two ideas in one. And the respondent will don't know if he, she is supposed to answer with yes or no. He will not know how to answer the question. But if we ask two questions, do you think Coca-Cola is a tasty drink? Yes, no. Do you think Coca-Cola is a refreshing soft drink? Yes, no. And then the situation is a bit different. Sometimes respondents don't have ability to answer, meaning they don't remember, they are not familiar with the topic of interest that we're actually researching, and we should, we should also respect those participants, and we should use filter questions. And apart, I will show how that is done with branching in the slides that follow, and we should also use the don't know option if the participants uh, decide to say that they don't know the question of interest. How we overcome their unwillingness to answer with uh, sometimes the participants are unwilling to answer specific questions which are which for their perception they seem for them that they are like out of the context and the researcher actually adjust the content a little bit in order for them to feel like they're answering in the same context also the purpose of the research if we share the purpose with the research for example we're doing this for the for the improvement of the social system in the country then it would be more appropriate from for them to actually answer the questions also there are sensitive information that we ask from the respondents like about their income like some relationship out of their marriage or etc that could embarrass them or it could threaten their self-image and they would not like to share with, with us as well. 
the, what is the solution? The solution is to place those questions which are sensitive topics at the end of the questionnaire. So the respondent has already invested time in the in the questionnaire to answer. Also, we can preface the questions with a statement that the behavior of interest is common. I will also show that on the next slide. We can also hide the question in a group of other questions so the respondent that the respondents are willing to answer and then we can read the questions quickly. We can draw to them. And also it is also very important that they are given sometimes it is more advisable to give them categories to provide with categories rather than ask for a specific figure and we should randomize the questions as well another strategy which should be included is determining the order of questions so the opening questions should be interesting, simple, easy to answer for the respondent, so the respondent can easily answer them and get trust in us as researchers. Apart from them, we should include some basic information. And finally, we have the identification information for the respondent, if this is needed. And the difficult questions at the end, which is, I will also have I will also show you some examples, difficult questions, questions that are sensitive, embarrassing, complex or dull should be put at the end of the questionnaire or a sentence. The question structure, there are different types of questions that you can use. They are divided into unstructured and structured. Unstructured are open-ended questions which they are given freedom to, to answer. On the other hand, structured, structured questions offer alternatives. Also, apart from this, we have the multiple choice questions and they're given several alternatives that they can tick. They can tick one or more than one alternatives. We have the dichotomous question they, that they can answer with yes, no. And at the end, they have the square scale questions where they actually uh, express the degree, the degree of their opinion. For example, that can be from extremely dissatisfied, dissatisfied, neither satisfied nor satisfied, satisfied, and at the end we have extremely satisfied. Choosing question wording is extremely important, and we should always have in mind the, ta uh, the target group that we will ask the question. For example, I have uh, an example here. Do you think that the distribution of soft drinks is adequate? Most of the respondents uh, would don't know how to answer this question, but if we pre-formulate the questions like, do you think that soft drinks are readily available when you want to buy them, then the situation looks uh, a bit different. Also, leading questions. We should avoid leading questions. A leading question is the one that actually leads the respondents in the direction that the answer should be. And we should avoid that. For example, do you think that patriotic French people should buy imported cars that would put French orders workers out of employment? Of course, that they should not buy imported cars because this will put French workers out of employment, right? And instead of that, we could pre-formulate the question is, do you think that French people should buy imported cars? So there will be no negative emotion or leading leading directions in the question. Also, very important is that every question should be easy to understood, concise, and as we said previously, without double ideas. If I ask you, how long do you live here? And you will say, where? In Macedonia, in Europe, in Africa, in this apartment, for example? No. But if I ask you, how long do you live in this apartment? And then you will say, I live in this apartment five years. And the situation is much different. Also, apart from these terms in all questions should be adjusted to the participants. Abbreviation and expert terms should not be used unless you're talking to an expert. And then in that situation, you must use abbreviation and expert terms. In all other cases, you should use the terms which participants, member of the members of the target groups, understand can understand. 
There should not be emotionally colored questions or directive questions. Emotionally colored questions are questions that involved bad words like niggers in the past, for example, and, and even now. And the people react to the word, to the emotion. They, they tend to answer, not to their opinion. And also, as we talked, there we have the directive questions that lead us into one direction. For example, scientists claims that nuclear power plants are more useful than harmful. Are you uh, for or against using nuclear energy? And in this case, they lead us to answer that, of course, that we are for using nuclear power plants because the scientists say that they are useful, right? Apart from this, all the sensitive questions should be formulated tactically and delicately, and we should put them in the context. If I ask you, is smoking marijuana harmful or not? You will rather not say this, uh, your opinion, but if we put this in a context, and if we say that this is a common behavior, some people think that smoking marijuana is harmful, some think it's not, what do you think about that? We accept actually the fact that some, of, some are using and some are not. So what do you think about that? We're putting it into a context, which actually puts a different shadow. Now I will continue with a, with the flow chart of branching. As we talked, some people actually, as we said, are not familiar with all our with all our aspects that we are trying to research, and we should give them the opportunity to answer as well. Although they are not familiar, for example, I have here an example with uh, with online buying. At, at the beginning, we put some introduction. We tell them that the research is going to be about usage of about usage of debit credit and debit cards, and then we will continue with online shopping, whether they bought the online shopping in the last month, whether they bought clothes or not. If they did not bought, then we will ask them, have you ever purchased online, in order not to exclude them, and they will answer yes or no, and based on this, we will also ask them whether they intend to buy in the future. On the other hand, those who stated, yes, we actually made a purchase last month, we will ask them how the purchase was made, whether it was made with credit card, debit card, via PayPal, or some other means of payment. So you can see the branching here. And this is the, the this is a very important part because it enables the respondents to, to answer or not answer to those questions that they are not familiar with. Uh, regarding the form and layout, it is important that the question should be divided into several parts. Each question, each uh, several questions should be grouped into a sections, and the questions should be numbered, particularly. As I shown you in the previous case, when branching questions are used, and the question should preferably be pre-coded to offer some alternative, so it could be easier for the respondent to to answer, and they should be numbered serially, of course. And now we came to the last part, and this is the pilot testing. Every research starts with pilot testing, which actually refers to a testing of the questionnaire on some small group of participants to identify and also <coughs> eliminate potential problems. It is most often used with, with uh, large-scale research when we don't want to make uh, some big mistakes and the questionnaire should not be used in the, in the survey without adequate pre-testing. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we should test all aspects of the questionnaire, like whether the wording is good for the respondents, whether they, whether they can understand it or not, uh, also whether they understand the content or not, what are we asking them. We're also testing the sequence, the, the order of questions, the form and layout as well. If a different form of layout would be more suitable for the respondents, and we also test our instructions to see whether they are clear to the respondents. What is important here is that the participants for the pilot test for the actual survey should be drawn from the same population. This is important because if you draw uh, participants for the pilot test from a different population, it would not be a valid uh, pilot testing. 
and what is actually the recommended sample sizes from 15 to 13 participants for each uh, large-scale project that we're doing. Pilot tests preferably should be done by personal interviews, no matter the mode, because usually when we're doing a face-to-face -face research, face-to-face -face questionnaire, uh, we can see what works, what doesn't work, and we can observe the, we can also observe the nonverbal uh, reactions and attitudes of the respondents. And finally, we can also see what did we got from the research, from the codes actually, from the the results from the pilot test, which could serve as a direction in which to go or not to go. So this would be all for today. If you have any questions now, you can write them, or you can also address them via email or via the platform that we are using. For deadline is Monday, as you know. And now the task is to create a questionnaire for the topic that you already create that you already conducted a desk research. We have a question, as I can see. You have some instructions there that there should be at least 30 questions in the questionnaire that you will create quantitative research and you should apply what you have what you heard today you learned oh thank you very much uh, elizabetha i thought it was a question Thirty questions with uh, demographic questions that we call them, and gender, age should be included. Yes, but they should be five, and the rest of them, twenty-five, should be related to the topic of interest. I hope this answers your question, Philip. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, I, I wish you a pleasant work. See you next Tuesday. Bye.